The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Welcome back. Um, people can sit at that back table, or Rob, you want to come up here? <laughs> so I, I said you'd have a special focus on you going class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm his twin brother. So. <laughs> Everybody can meet my twin brother, Rob. Rob's not your guest speaker, he's my guest, uh, but he will speak a little later when we talk about Norio Rabini and Rabini's thoughts on blockchain economics. Rob worked at T. Rowe Price for 25 years, 24 years? 20 years, before that on Wall Street and Solomon Brothers most of So he's from Solomon Brothers Wall Street, he started his own hedge fund and that didn't work out, so he closed that hedge fund, he went to work for T. Rowe Price. Uh, for 20 years, and he ran a, a global equity fund, but before that he was doing telecom and, and, and in investment. But I will ask Rob, as an asset manager who ran $20 billion of money at one point in time and was successful at it, his thoughts about this cryptocurrency, crypto phase. He has not, as opposed to everybody in this class, he has not read the readings for today's class, but I know you all read the readings, maybe. Uh, uh, but that will be when we're talking a little bit about the blockchain minimalists. So we're now turning into what I call Act Two. We've talked a lot about the economics of blockchain throughout talking about the technology. But now we're going to take today and Thursday really to dive a little bit more into the economics. Now, of course, we're talking about the economics the entire semester, but this is going to be just, you know, we're just going to stay right on that. And because my goal on this journey together is that we all get a little bit closer to the ground truth, separating the hype from the reality. Um, I've, I've tried to put in the readings, if, you, if you've chosen to sort of even do the skim reader look in, some of the blockchain minimalists, like the Norio Rabini piece that you, you had. And it doesn't get much more minimalist than Rabini's piece. But I think it's, it's relevant to know where Paul Krugman or Nora Rabini or Joe Stiglitz or others are on this technology. I don't happen to agree with them, but I'm not all the way over on the other side. I'm not with the Tim Drapers. And, and, and yesterday, I had the honor to appear at a conference in New York City where Fidelity was rolling out their new blockchain uh, uh, a digital asset business. Um, and so I was the setup speaker, I guess. But one of the other speakers there was Mike Novogratz, who started a company called Galaxy. I would put Mike and some others closer to the maximalist, or he, he cautioned me he's not a 10 on the 10 scale, he's probably an 8. So, but I, I've tried to put into this readings and this course so that you can leave this course with critical reasoning skills. Um, really, what are the economics? So let's go on that journey together today. Um, and also, I say, think about some of what we're talking about today in, in light of your final projects, because you're going to be looking for some pain point in finance or if with a little special discussion with me outside of finance and saying, what's a use case that all this crazy blockchain stuff can come together and actually uh, uh, work, work on it? So, um, so the overview, of course, is always I'll talk a little bit about what our readings. I'll see if we'll do a little Socratic method. So we're going to talk about blockchain economics, a little bit about blockchain versus the internet. That was Joey Ito's article that kind of set that up. And Joey wrote that several years ago. He might write it a little differently now, but I, I still think it's really relevant to get behind. How do we think of blockchain versus the internet? I call him the minimalist whether it's Rabini or Krugman or Stiglitz but, or Gensler. You're going to hear from one back in the, the that Gensler, who came three minutes after this Gensler. Uh, well, he might have come before me, actually, because, Rob, you lived in Botswana, and didn't they believe that the second 
delivered was the first conceived. <laughs> but we're identical, so maybe it didn't have that, that way. Um, and some costs, and I'm sorry, I mean, you know, I, oh, yes, we have to do the twins thing, you know. <laughs> how, many, how many twins in this class? Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, it might be just statistical. And, and you said your Peruvian identical twin? I have an identical twin. Identical to it. I have it. Yeah, he's a medical doctor. He lives in Peru. And in Peru, by the way, they, they do say that the second is the older. <laughs> the second delivered is? Kind of the older. So has the birthright. <laughs> <laughs> I was the first, so I tend to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Rob has the birthright in Peru. <laughs> um, we'll talk about costs and trade-offs. We've done a little bit of this in the past, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, and a little fewer s slides. I slimmed this out just to, so we can have a, a bit more discussion. But um, the study questions, how do decentralized blockchain applications affect the, the cost of verification and cost of networking? And, and anybody want to dive into that, or we want to dive in when I do the, the little bit? I'll give my read about how blockchain changes verification and networking. Those are the two things. Uh, that was in the Christian Catalini paper. I know you didn't love it that I signed a 30-some page paper. But Christian's at the forefront of this. He's in the Sloan faculty. He's, in a, uh, 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 he's not here. He's sort of on a sabbatical semester. But Christian's paper, he's at the forefront of the economics around blockchain. And you can't take a good blockchain course without reading Catalini's paper. Um, and it's not just because he's a Sloany. Uh, I think he's, he's kind of got that. Um, and then the co comparison to the internet. So it's a, sort of those two, two big items. And I know, I've, uh, somebody said there were too many readings. There was only five that were required. Um, of course, uh, Rubini's was just low-hanging fruit because he, he gave it last Thursday. And it was, uh, uh, how many people read the Rubini piece? It wasn't required, but so about a third or a half. Do you agree it was kind of a slap down? <laughs> what do you think, Aline? It was hilarious. I loved it. <laughs> you loved it? You couldn't really finish it, but it was hilarious. How many of you that read the uh, Rabini piece found that you agreed with most of what he said? OK, so two, three, four, five. Oh, Aline, six. Lauren. Wow. I don't know. Every time I read one, I'm like, yeah, they totally know what they're talking about. I'm on board. And I feel the same way with all the, like, Minimalists now. So you're you're identifying with the minimalists now? Okay. Okay. On Thursday you're gonna read things like an open letter to Jamie Diamond that kind of goes it's not a maximalist, but it kind of goes the other way. Um, and then the uh, optional uh, bits. So let's start a little bit with blockchain economics. Um, uh, and, and, the, and the first thing, verification. So what are, you, what are the costs? Anybody who actually dived in or dove into the uh, longer Catalini piece. The cost of verification. And these are things that uh, I'm not just presenting because somebody wrote about it. I, I, think, I think Christian's right about this. I think that the blockchain can, doesn't always, but can really lower the cost of verification. Um, do you have a? Um, he, just, he talked about uh, efficiently verifying, auditing the transactions that happen, and the cost of that is low. So efficiently auditing and lowering the cost of auditing transactions. What else did he talk about, Kelly? Part of that efficiency was the fact that currently there's quite a few third-party actors that are involved, like separate between like, the, the input and output actors. Right, so you might have fewer people in the chain, m m fewer actors. Uh, Anton, uh, they also mentioned the privacy costs and also uh, the censorship. Risk. Okay, so let me, let me you, you raise two, privacy and censorship. Do you, do you want to say, or somebody else, what, what is it about privacy? I mean, because these are really critical things that blockchain can do. And so with privacy, right, the addresses are synonymous, so like there's no name attached to an address, so you can interact peer to peer without people knowing who you are necessarily. Right. So, but why does that matter? So, uh, 
why would people pay more to be able to do that? Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, there's an understanding that there's like a fundamental right to privacy, right? You don't want the world to know all of your doings. So some of it's about rights and values, uh, James. The other key element was the hacking. There's clear examples when people's information are so readily available okay. and a third party get hacked. Totally agree, but what's the big commercial thing that's going on right now in big data? Um, intermediaries yeah. can, can, can uh, profit from that information they're right. gathering. As, as I mean, the, the dominant, I'm sorry. I think was John. the resale of the, the data, uh, user data as well as the, uh, right. the leakage in, uh, in social security. So what Sean and Eric are saying, the dominant revenue model in tech today, whether it's big tech like, um, uh, Facebook and, and Google and so forth, or any tech, the dominant revenue model, not the only, is basically give me some of your data, let me analyze it, and either advertise against it, or somehow in these days use machine learning and AI to analyze it and really market other products back to you, maybe. Um, we all do it, we live in this, we give up our data, some more so than others, some less so, but it's a big piece. Blockchain, uh, Catalini races, well maybe you can get a little bit more privacy, if you wish it, it might be part of the revenue model. How about censorship? What was the, the point about censorship? Anyway, so when you're dealing with a central authority, a commercial bank, they can decide whether to extend credit or not. That's a form of censorship. It's a form of allocating something. Um, but it can be as, as simple as to whether to even sell you the ticket to the movie theater or not, you know, in a sense. It doesn't happen to us often. But distributed, uh, decentralized platforms are more censorship resistant, I mean, on a spectrum. Anything else from verification? So let's see how we did. So this was how I sort of take it back, these six points. The direct cost. There may be a cost trade-off that blockchain could have a lower cost of verification. It doesn't always, but a lot of verification in finance has multiple back offices trying to reconcile between ledgers. We've talked a lot in this class about ledgers, ledgers recording property rights. So you can have one bank recording the property rights, another bank recording a property right. It could be the ownership of equities. It could be cash called payments. So there's a lot of direct costs that it can lower. And I would say in the permission blockchain space, a lot of big banks are looking at that very first point. We can just lower our direct costs of the back office. Stop there, straight and simple. We have a lot less reconciliation costs. Privacy and data leakage costs. I call it both privacy, which sounds like, you know, Hugo, and I want my personal privacy, or I just know kind of Facebook is taking my data. I call that data leakage. You know, I'm not terribly worried about it, but, God, it's, it's, it's something. Aline. So I'm very curious. Is there a use case here? Because I really failed to see one. Like, I could see privacy in the sense that, well, you could transfer coins from anonymous spenders to anonymous receivers and you could even hide the amount and that's useful for business because businesses don't want other businesses knowing what they're up to. But what other use case is there? Oh, I think it's a very good question. Anybody have an answer for a link? Because I do, but I just do others. Like a business use case where you might have users not giving up as much of their data and privacy. Okay, I'm going to use Uber. Oh, oh did you? Uh, yeah, I think an, an example I can think of is, for example, the hedge fund in the uh, asset management. Fund? It, a hedge fund. Uh, hedge fund. In, in asset management industry, you don't want to know, like, because, for example, also the hedge funds, they hide behind the brokers. Uh, they, they have certain, like, swaps with the brokers, so they don't have to review their position the build, they build, and also they try <coughs> to build their position under the 5% threshold. So, in this way, because any action, their action, maybe can move the market of a certain stock. Okay, so there's a commercial situation as an asset manager. I might not want others to know what trades I'm doing, what positions I'm taking. 
I was going to use a personal situation. You could envision Uber having been created on a blockchain. It's not on a blockchain, but I'm saying you could have envisioned it. Riders, equipment owners, caught car owners, and drivers. It's like three communities, who owns the car, who drives the car, who needs the cars, um, coming together on a blockchain. And maybe part of the reason I'm comfortable with a blockchain Uber, maybe, me, is I might have a few girlfriends, and I don't want anybody tracking that I'm visiting different girlfriends. This would be, you would call it privacy, but perfectly, uh, I'm single. I'm single. <laughs> but, but I'm just saying that you know, it's a perfectly legitimate thing that do I want to share that data? We all share a tremendous amount of data if we use a credit card that, particularly in today's world of machine learning and AI, that you can take somebody's spending patterns and really narrow down. Let's, for instance, say that I have a certain religious affiliation or a certain uh, um, pro-guns or anti-guns or, or, or any orientation I might have. You get enough spending patterns, you can sort of piece together. That, that's probably you. That's probably your religion. That's probably your sexual orientation. That's probably the country you're from, the ethnic group if you pull enough spending pattern coupled with machine learning and AI. So, so use cases, people are really talking about, well, maybe, maybe there's something that I can give a little privacy-preserving attribute. It won't be the dominant use case, but something. And that, this class today is just about economics. That's a legitimate economic thing that's going on here. Was there a hand over here? Right. No. Uh, censorship risk. Basically that, oh, I'm sorry. Can I ask a related question? So in terms of the privacy, the, the article also mentioned like uh, those uh, financial institutions, like before this, they can just keep their data like uh, inside and only maybe reveal that to regulators. But if we use the blockchain, they need to make all those information public. And that's kind of like the other, it's like the opposite to keeping it private. So, the, so to the regulators. You said? I mean, inter, like, say, one thing, it keeps you anonymous. So that's kind of protection of privacy. But on the other side, you need to public all the information, which may otherwise be just among some, uh, some certain institutions. Right. So you're absolutely, remind me your first name. Jennifer. Jennifer. Jennifer is right. There's a tension. Uh, the traditional blockchains like Bitcoin have both. They, have, they mask a lot of data because of the pseudonymity. But it's not truly completely masked because you can use forensics and track things. And to verify a permissionless blockchain, it's all public. So I agree with you. It sort of goes both ways. Um, there are technical ways, whether through zero knowledge proofs and other ways, to have more privacy. But I'm saying there's a legitimate economic cause. Paul Krugman's last sentence in his op-ed was, tell me a use case. Tell me, re remember Krugman's like, la he's a Nobel laureate. Paul's brilliant, and he writes eloquently for the New York Times. But there, there are, and Jennifer, you're right, it's not perfect yet, but there are privacy attributes that you can give to a system. Uh, I do want to clarify, I only have one girlfriend. She lives in New York. <laughs> I just want to make sure. <laughs> It was a hypothetical about Uber. <laughs> Realized we're on film. The others all think it's me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. There was a story. No. Okay. Settlement. We've talked about this. I think if you don't have some economics around settlement, that you don't need some immutable record of the movement of a right, particularly a property right, you might just as well just stay with a traditional database. I'm not sure I'm entirely right about that. There might be some permissioned blockchain worthwhile, but I'm kind of a view if you're not moving some something that matters. And settlement means something that's final. We talked briefly at, uh, six or eight lectures ago about that old lawsuit in Scotland, the Crawford case, 
that if James steals a dollar from me, but then hands the dollar to Andrew, I can't get it back from Andrew. I have no legal rights to get my dollar from Andrew. I might have legal rights about James, but it's final. There's final settlement. It's, it's Andrew's dollar. So there's some things that you just want finality. One thing I would talk about is a lot of merchants in the US don't like paying 2.5% to 3% of all their sales to the payment system, Visa, First Data, and so forth. A lot of that goes to the banks, not to Visa and First Data. And a lot of that is also for what's called chargebacks. So I was the chief financial officer of the Hillary campaign. Now, it was really lousy that we lost for a lot of, lot of reasons beyond this discussion about blockchain. But I continue to be the CFO for the next six months because we had to wind down a campaign. And we had to deal with what I called the computer and refrigerator graveyard. You know, the hundreds of people we had working at headquarters left the equipment and they, they left. Um, but the other thing I had to deal with for 60 days was chargebacks. You know that donors could go to Visa and say, no, I didn't really buy that donation. You know, whether it was $50, you know, low dollar, or $2,700. Um, and, you know, so I have a personal, you know, sense of this whole chargeback thing. Uh, now, donations to a political campaign are different than services you buy, but it's something merchants deal with a lot. Hugo. Are, are merchants responsible, then, to pay Visa to refund the client? Or is it on Visa and First Data? Like we were, in essence, the merchant, and yes, we had to pay. The campaign, and as this happens in every losing campaign, it didn't have anything well, to do with it. already spent the money. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a real problem. And, and what the payment processing companies, in that case, it's, it's a matter of public record. We used a company called Stripe uh, rather than First Data and so forth. I mean, the Stripes of this world uh, are taking some counterparty risk. Now, most merchants are not shutting down. We were shutting down, um, you know, but yeah. So uh, effectively, it's on the merchant. Um, cost of trust. In blockchain, there is a cost of trust, but it's trusting the code, the computer code. You're tr trusting the Bitcoin core developers, so to speak, and the consensus protocol. So when some people say it's trustless, it's not truly trustless. You still have to trust the code. You have to trust the consensus protocol versus the trust in the central intermediary. So it's sort of trade-off of, of, yes, Ali? You're also trusting the network in Bitcoin, just a reminder. Yes, you're trusting the network in Bitcoin. It's a very good point. I think, by and large, we all trust the network, even when we're dealing with Citibank as well. But you're right that right in the center of a blockchain solution, you're trusting the network for all its communications. Uh, but even, even at a central intermediary, there's some trust in the network. Yeah, but not for correctness. So in Bitcoin, you can double spend if the network, if the network messes up. But in a permissioned algorithm, you cannot double spend if the it's network not, messes up. There's different, it, different issues. I agree with that. You're good. You're good. I, I mean, I would go one step further and say you also trust the ISP, right? Not just Citibank, but you're trusting the intermediary that gets you to Citibank's website. But then I have put it's some true. fake website in, in between there. Right. right. So there's there's layers of trust all throughout this. But That's right. And I drive a car, uh, not when I'm in Boston. When I drive a car, and I'm trusting the carburetor as well. And I don't really know how a carburetor works. Um, but um, so there's all sorts of layers of trust, but I would say that the central trade-off with blockchain is you're moving away from trusting the central intermediary and you're trusting code and consensus. Um, and then economic rents, and we've talked about this. I mean, it is not the reason why payment systems cost a half a percent to a percent of GDP around the globe, but some of that is economic rents. And the financial sector in the U.S. is a trillion and a half dollars or seven and a half percent of our economy. There's a fair degree of economic rents in there. So these are kind of the six or seven things, not only that I think is worthwhile to discern out of Christian Canalini's paper, but it's also to Paul Krugman. There are 
legitimate things that you would say, well, we, we can maybe lower the cost of verification. The second big piece in Catalini, he talked about networks. Now, these are my words, not his, but it's basically the value networking, moving property rights. But again, because I'm thinking blockchain is about property rights. I mean, we, we can talk differently. But moving some property right or computer code that's going to trigger a smart contract that's going to be installed and move some property rights around. And does blockchain have an ability to lower the cost to develop or operate the network? Basically, in Catalini's words, to jumpstart the network or get over the collective action challenges. And collective action challenges are always in business when you're trying to start a business. Some businesses, it's really hard to get over the collective action issues. I mean, I don't know that any of you would have read a business case on, on uh, Federal Express. But, but when I first went to business school, they still had a case on Federal Express because the gentleman, I think it was Fred Smith, who started this incredible idea, how do you do overnight delivery the first day? How do you make sure you have enough airplanes to fly all the packages, in his case, to Memphis, Tennessee, and then to fly the packages somewhere else where you have no customers? You have no employees, and you have the, all these collective action issues within one company. Uber, Bitcoin itself, had to get, get and jump over and build a network. Facebook built a network. You know, there's all sorts of study about how you build a network and how you sort of move towards a network and get the big payday of a network. Blockchain can be part of that. I'm not saying it's the only way, but it is one thing. Um, and and, and uh, uh, Christian speaks about two things. A token, and yes, token economics might not have much to do with many things, but a token might incentivize and help fund the network. So it's a new form of crowdfunding. And economically speaking, there's been crowdfunding for centuries, but I mean, it's a new form of crowdfunding kind of building on what Kickstarter starter and uh, others have done to basically have a community of interest to pre-fund a project before it's functional. Now, we get into all sorts of public policy issues of whether it's a security or not. But the raw economics is it's a, it's a, form, it's a new form of, of, of crowdfunding before the theater is going to show its show. But it also might be an incentive mechanism during an operating phase. That's one where I'm a little bit less sure of. I have to admit, I might be a, on the 1 to 10 scale kind of a 2 or a 3. And I don't want my bias to infect you all, though, because there's some people that think there really are lots of token economics to help operate. I think the first one, it's a great way to crowdfund. I think that's already been shown. I think that's, that's kind of been proven. I'm less sure about the second one. Do we need tokens? and token economics to run a platform. But let us not forget, there are many gaming sites that effectively have tokens. They might be called hammers and swords. How many of you are gamers? You don't want to admit it, maybe? Got six or seven? So what's, what, what do you have to pay a lot for? Is it shields, swords, or hammers these days? Um, actually, I'm going to work for Activision Blizzard, but uh, you have to. One of the big ones is skins. It's skins. Like a, yeah. Who figures? All right. <laughs> yeah. So there's a social community. There's a reward and incentive system in gaming that's very real and has been deeply studied. Uh, and it's an, a re reward or an affinity or an identity. I mean, some of you probably have affinity or identity points or air miles. Anybody collect air miles? All right. You know. Do you do it just for the travel that you can get, or do you feel a little cool when you get extra points? <laughs> you don't have to admit that, Tom. Hey, I'll take anything I can to be cool. Right. <laughs> you know, you, you remember that uh, uh, George Clooney movie, Up in the Air? How many people saw Up in the Air? And do you remember one of the later scenes when he finally 
he, he wins. He's like 10 million miles. So you know, there is a piece of human nature. And the people who are maximalist on the last point say this is part of an incentive system, like that scene in Up in the Air. I, I'm towards the minimalist end, but I have to respect it. It might be I should be more neutral on that point. Uh, Metcalf's law. Anybody know Metcalf's law other than Aline? <laughs> Brodish? Yeah, yeah, I figured. <laughs> so Brodish, have you told a class? Do you have a PhD too somewhere or something? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I didn't know. Like, you know, there was a word going around. So Metcalf's law, I think it talks about the, the value of our network and it is being proportional to the square of the number of nodes. Right. Parts. So it's, a, it's an important concept that the value increases with the number of nodes idea if I can only call alpha and alpha can call me, he doesn't find that very valuable to call me actually, but that's the bit. But if alpha can now call five people, he, he doesn't view that as just five times more valuable, but maybe it's five squared, the number of nodes. Now, further studies have sort of said that doesn't really work once you get probably past 100 or 150 nodes. Alpha doesn't really care. Once he can call his first 150 people, you know, is it really, going to keep going up. So there's a modified uh, Metcalf's law that talks about n times log n. But whatever the actual value is, the concept is that it's nonlinear. And that is part of the reason why Apple and Google and Amazon trade where they trade. Why are they worth $500 billion to a trillion dollars? Rob will tell us why. <laughs> you know, in the marketplace, but part of it is this Metcalf's law that it's nonlinear with two billion, uh, quote, users of Facebook. Um, uh, and so part of token economics are around Metcalf's law, and you'll hear people sort of say this, so I thought I'd make sure you have it. So back to Joey Ito. Tom. Before we jump to this, as I was reading the, the Catalina paper, I kept thinking about the transaction costs and the cost of hashing, particularly for Bitcoin and a proof of work system, and how those things, I, I still just can't wrap my brain around the idea that Bitcoin becomes so diffuse, but yet transaction fees are small enough that it, that's possible. Is your worry that in, in Bitcoin's case that the proof of work and the electricity and the hashing function is just by design is going to be costly for a long time. Right. I mean, we think back to last winter where there were too many transactions for the Bitcoin blockchain and transaction fees. Right. So, so one of the big, uh, I'm going to hold this point for a bit, but you're going to see. One of the big thing, the minimalist, I call them, the minimalist would say is by its very design and nature, blockchain is meant to be complex. It's meant to have some latencies because it doesn't have a central authority. And the trade-off of having a central authority is some complexity. You call it the hashing, the proof of work, the other, the network. Aline would say, well, you've got you to propagate on a network. You have some latencies. In Bitcoin's case, blocks are added every 10 minutes. Whatever that bucket of complexity and design features to not have a central authority, that by its very nature, the minimalists say, will never, never take off in any scalable way. Though I th respect each piece of that argument, I think, one, we might move to other consensus formulas. Two, it doesn't have to take off in every use case. The question is whether in some use cases it will provide an alternative to a central intermediary. Right. Just think uh, about like but if you're saying about Bitcoin, how it's designed right now, I think Bitcoin, it's very hard to get to very big scalable solutions. Right. Like the idea of using Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee versus my Visa card when the required transaction cost is. It's probably too high right now. That's probably true. But uh, we're going to hear on, on November 15th, we're, we are going to have not just guests, but guest speakers when Jeff. Uh, and Kelly, Jeff Sprecher and Kelly Loeffler are coming. Jeff is the Chief Executive Officer of Intercontinental Exchange. And, and I hope you stick with the class, or even if you don't stick with the class, 
you come because Jeff and Kelly, Kelly is the CEO of, of their new startup, Backed. We'll hold your question for Jeff and Kelly. And Jeff's one of the great entrepreneurs in the US. Um, so the question that Ito raises in his write-up is, is Bitcoin kind of the next layer? Did we go, you know, all these protocols of internet? And these are just the four big known. There's, there's dozens of other protocols, sub-protocols, and so forth. But is Bitcoin kind of that next protocol? Um, so what, what did you all take out of Joey's uh, work? And again, it was about three years ago. But if Joey were here today, he's still, this is his architecture. He, he, he started, he runs the Media Lab. He started the first uh, internet service provider in his bathroom in Tokyo at 23 years old. Um, and he's lived it. Any thoughts from his piece? No. Same. Uh, do I cold call? <laughs> Akira, did you read the? Yeah. Um, interesting. Interesting point for me is the uh, email. It was the uh, killer application for internet. Right. And uh, Bitcoin could be the first killer app of blockchain. That was the. Uh, so what do you think? Do you agree with Ito or not? Um, controversial about the uh, blockchain. Uh, um, Bitcoin, because the, uh, as Dr. Rubini said, the uh, you know, um, concentration right. of the miners, right. uh, Russia, China, etc. So, uh, blockchain versus the internet. Some thoughts. Um, both are open protocols. I mean, they're a little bit different protocols, but you know, broadly for this level, uh, it, both are open protocols. Um, both transport packets of data around a distributed network. Now, in the case of blockchain, or certainly Bitcoin, those packets are packets of data representing some property right that then becomes known as value. Remember, when blockchain start, when Bitcoin started, it wasn't worth anything. It was kind of an idea. But then all of a sudden, it was worth a penny a, a coin, so to speak. And, and when that, those two pizzas were delivered, May 22nd, uh, 2010, it took a year and a half for anybody to transact. 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas. So it started to have some value. But at first, it was a, just an electronic code, a property right. Whereas the internet is content. Um, both have apps built on top of a protocol level. So. Facebook is really an app on top of a protocol level, and there's many other apps on top of a protocol level, and we studied smart contracts. So just, you know, for, for your thinking about this, and if you're investing in it or if you're managing around this, is somebody pitching you on a protocol level, like Ethereum, like Bitcoin, a new protocol level that other things are built on top of, or is it an app? built on top of it, usually through a smart contract, not always. The layer one is like Bitcoin and Ether. Layer two is like the Lightning Network. And maybe there should be something that's interoperable. Um, and one of the reasons he thinks of, of Bitcoin as an app, I don't use that vocabulary. There's not settled vocabulary. What you've highlighted, there's not settled vocabulary. Like this would be a heck of a class to give a vocabulary test in. Because in fairness to students, there's not a settled vocabulary. Even on the word blockchain, are permissioned systems blockchain or not? The purist would say no. Uh, I would say, well, yes, it's blockchain. I, I might not be that pure uh, around blockchain. <laughs> sure. Is that right? No, Rob's not going to answer. Um, uh, both are said to be open network development. But I would contend, really, in both, there's a lot of centralization. Um, and, and Joey Ito writes about how a group around ICANN really does a lot of the centralized. I'm talking about internet protocol, not the apps on top of it. And of course, the Bitcoin core developers, or in Ethereum, if Vitalik Buterin sneezes, everybody wants to know which way did he sneeze. So there, there's a lot of centralization around development, but it is open. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's open source. But it's highly centralized in, in kind of in both cases. Um, 
interoperability, and this is, goes back to Joey's point. <clears throat> Bitcoin is not interoperable with Ether, which is not interoperable with EOS, et cetera, et cetera. They all are kind of in their own space. They're not that ultimate base layer. And so I think of it, I might have the wrong word, is almost like the era when there was a private intranet and it's not truly the internet, Bitcoin. It's not communicating that word intranet meant between networks. Aline will correct my words here. What does it mean for Bitcoin to be interoperable with Ethereum? So for all intents and purposes, right now, you could do these atomic cross-chain swaps where you could swap some Ethereum into Bitcoin. So that's pretty amazing in itself. What more do you want? So Alina is saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Slow down. You can move something of value from one ledger system, the Bitcoin ledger system, to the Ethereum ledger system through something called atomic swaps, which we talked about, which is a form of a layer two. Uh, and maybe I don't want anything more. Maybe that solves this problem. But there still is a problem <coughs> that the Bitcoin code, scripting code, is different than the Ethereum scripting code. And you might say, so who cares? But they are separate networks. You have to have this atomic swap to jump between Bitcoin and Ether. And you'd have to have a, probably a different protocol to jump from Ether to EOS. Depends on what you mean by different. Same algorithm, but yeah, probably. Uh, but but they, they solve different problems, so that's why the script in Bitcoin is different than the EVM and Ethereum, for example. So they, by nature, they have to be different. I, I've said this to this class before. I think a lot of the interoperability challenges will, will get past them. But we're really at a different stage. The, the internet pre-1990s, before the World Wide Web in 91 or 92, and there were still like more private networks, this feels like we're still kind of closer to that stage of the internet. Aline's pointing out, well, maybe we're closer to the World Wide Web because the solution is atomic swaps and jumping. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to take your I'm going to jump in. Rob, here. speak up because I can't hear you. Sorry, if you can't hear me, but they're like euros and dollars and yen. You still have to worry about the currency exchange rate, no matter what you techies over here, sorry, can say, oh, but I can do this in my sleep. Yeah, but what's it worth to me? Because this price is going up and that price is going down. And the minute you get currency exchange and value questions in there, it's not seamless, okay? It's just not seamless. It might be seamless technologically, but... But that was the whole point of starting Ethereum, starting Bitcoin, is that you're gonna have two different currencies, so like, right. make up your mind. Like, so what, currency what Rob is raising, not what Rob, this is a debate. There's not one right or wrong. What Rob is raising is there's friction. Right, if there's a store of value, what is my value relative to this other currency, this other, you know, yeah, point? Well, so. Uh, just to clarify, I don't understand what people mean when they say interoperability. Like, I really don't know what they mean. I hear this a lot, and I don't know what they mean, what they want. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, what I mean. And I, I should understand what they mean, because I'm the technical person, right? So right, right, right. But you, you haven't gotten your PhD yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> all right, all right. Money side to interoperability. That's what I'm bringing up. You know, interoperably, technically, might be fine, but the money side is they have a, you know, is one worth two or is one worth three? And it's, so, so what I what I mean by interoperability is that you, with the lowest amount of friction, one might even say seamlessly, move across various ledgers in this space. I mean, inter interoperable can mean things differently elsewhere, but so it's like if I I'm a financial firm and I set up a blockchain system. Can it speak to and move information and data and value with my legacy databases to the blockchain? That's not going to be zero friction. There's going to be some friction moving stuff from the legacy systems to this system. And if it's blockchain to blockchain, again, what I think of is can you, with the lowest amount of friction, costs, whether the cost or what Rob's talking about, like the currency risk cost, or just how you hook up the API or atomic swaps, with the lowest amount of friction. And so from a user interface, is it seamless? If I'm an institutional user, can I hop, skip, and a jump across these systems? 
Let me move on, but that's, that would be my lay definition. Um, the incentives. In blockchain, and particularly Bitcoin, you have miners. But there are incentives even in, in the inter, internet that you have registries and registrars that, that Joey talks about, but other incentives. You have somebody's got to be motivated to keep this thing alive and program uh, as well. And then I would lastly talk about the government. The internet kind of came out of the government. U.S. Department of Defense and something called DARPA in the 19, late 60s, 70s, it kind of, government ultimately by the 1990s took a light touch approach to the internet, but it wasn't like the internet was birthed in a libertarian, like, you know, anti-government way. And, and, and Bitcoin and Satoshi Nakamoto and the papers all kind of came from this cypherpunk libertarian ethos and culture. So it's a little bit different cultural background. It doesn't mean the internet loves government, but it just sort of had a little bit different background. Alexis, Rosetta, or you're just thinking. Um, I should have said there's one other point, significant investment. The internet took 20 to 25 years before a lot of money got thrown. And an avalanche of money came into the internet by the mid, no, mid to late 90s. Amazon, eBay, and some others, I think, were started in 1995. Netscape and everything that was going on. But by 98, 99, and 2000, you had that huge avalanche of money. The avalanche of money into blockchain is not as big, but it came earlier. There was a good 15 to 20 years of quiet development on research labs like at MIT and, and the Defense Department before that avalanche of money came to the internet. And here we had it much faster. Um, those are like my sense of some of the differences um, with, with it. So now let's talk about the minimalists. They're kind of fun. As the paintings in the corner sort of suggest, <laughs> minimalist. This was the one that I think was talked about before. Tom, so what else do the minimalists say? I, 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 I'm going to have like 10 or 15 things. Who, who's the minimalist? Aline's a minimalist. Who else is kind of agrees with Rabini right now? Show of hands, anybody? All right, so I've got, and you're still coming to class. It's good. It's good. General, what else is in the minimalist camp? Rob, get ready because you're going to give your view. Uh, so, class is one, historical value is another one because the class is not. Uh, so you're saying it's not a good store of value, all right? Not a good store of value. Let's just kind of roll. Um, Tom? I don't know if this is the same, but it has no intrinsic value. It has no intrinsic value. I'll take that. Sean? And the one thing that's really interesting is the Gini, uh, Gini coefficient uh, that you mentioned in the Highly concentrated, the wealth concentration. Wealth concentration. Others? Remind me of your first name? Jack. Jack. Similar, similar point is that it's a leader. There's more than one Jack in the class. <laughs> Jack, Jack Goldinger, NBA 2019. <laughs> <laughs> Good move. Um, is that it's, it's not really decentralized. So it, there was some stat that 99% of transactions go through centralized exchanges. Right. So I, I usually ask in, in, in talks how many people have owned Bitcoin. Yesterday, I am at a very high end conference in New York with 150 to 200 what I call a curated invitation list. And Fidelity is rolling out this big announcement. So the people in the room are kind of engaged. And Mike Novogratz, who made personally a half a billion dollars on, on betting on Ether and Bitcoin. He, it was more Ether than Bitcoin, but on those two. I asked how many people own Bitcoin two-thirds of the hand have traded or owned Bitcoin. Two-thirds of the hand go up, as you would think, in a room like that. How many had owned it directly on the blockchain, meaning they downloaded the software, they have the nodes. Of the about 100 hands that it went up that had owned it or traded, three hands went up. In that pretty darn sophisticated, high-touch area. So it's rather centralized because of crypto exchanges. Other? Other issues? There's 51% issue, uh, such as uh, the miners are almost oligopoly in the. So it's subject to the 51% majority attack. 
And as Rubini points out, that's probably more true with regard to the small coins. If you start a coin and there's only a million dollars of value or even 50 million of value and there's only a, a dozen or a hundred nodes, it's far easier to overwhelm it than this thing like Bitcoin that's lived out there in the wild, one might say in the swamp for all these 10 years. But a state actor with a few probably single digit billions to mess around could do a 51% attack even on Bitcoin. You know, if the government of China or the government of North Korea really wanted to buy enough computing power and ASICs, or frankly, maybe even the government of China would just take over those two big mining pools that are in China. Uh, I, I don't know, but, or the government of Russia, there's a big mining pool and they, you know. So 51% attacks, it's kind of an interesting thing. Other, other things? Uh, no killer apps, so it's hard. No killer apps. So hey, where's the there there? Uh, like there are a lot of bugs in their code. A lot of bugs. So bugs, bugs in the. So there's still a lot to work out. So let me show you the list, and then Rob's going to tell us what he thinks. Uh, there's many technical challenges. We've talked about this at an earlier lecture. We're not through the scalability performance end of this. Again, I keep contending, I think in single digit years, not months, but years, we'll get through a lot of these scalability things. Maybe I'm too cockeyed optimist about the ability of technologists here at MIT and elsewhere, but I think we'll get through a lot. We won't necessarily get through the governance. There's still a bunch of collective action issues, but I think maybe we're already through the interoperability. I think there's still stuff to do there. Um, they lack intrinsic value, that was said. You didn't say there's a lot of volatility. A lot of people raise that there's just a ton of volatility in these things. Um, that's not a technical bug, but it's a, it's a feature of the crypto itself. Um, and we talked about limited adoption. Uh, Paul Krugman's piece says, hey, they're not accepted for taxes. They're not legal tender. Fiat currencies have a, an advantage because over the last three or 400 years, Nearly every society around the globe has said, let's accept them for taxes and legal tender. Good point to Paul Krugman. He's right. Can't get around that. Um, <clears throat> having multiple currencies counter an economic history and logic. This is Rubini's point. But like, do we really need 20, 50, 100, 1,000 separate currencies? Maybe not. But on the other side, why is it, what did you call it, skins? Yeah, why is it that some people will value skins in the middle of a gaming site or affinity points? So I, I wouldn't necessarily discard it completely. That's, that's like, I just, I think that's too simplistic to completely discard it. And then token mon monetary policy. We've talked about it. Bitcoin, you can have the maximum of 21 million coins by the year 2140. It's put in the code. Um, do we want it to be the base currency? It's not technically the monetary policy. It's the base monetary policy. Only in code or do we want humans? The minimalists would also tell you that um, blockchains tend towards centralization. Whether it's crypto exchanges, whether it's development, the mining pools themselves, the holders, and even alternative consensus protocols. So right now you're thinking you're going to go to the door and get out of this blockchain class. But it's important to kind of know these things to think, all right, now where, where can it have a place? Nobody raised the private key thing. You lose your private key, you're done. In most ledger systems, we have backdoor ways to correct that. If I lose my password, if a bank sometimes get, somehow gets hacked, there's a way to backdoor and protect against the loss. This is the other side of finality. If we truly want final settlement, this is the other side. Buterin's trilemma, I'm not going to review that again. We talked about. And then people doubt the claims of token economics. I'm probably a little bit in that camp. Oh, no killer app. The scams and frauds. All right. Rob, what do you think? Yeah, Rob ran a $20 billion fund, and he's not read a single thing on the syllabus. 
No, I haven't even read a single thing on blockchain. In the 90s, um, I was a tech... Over quits. Yeah. Um, in the 90s, I was a tech and telecom investor, and it's relevant to inform my biases because I saw, you know, Google wasn't the first search engine that came public and came through our offices. It wasn't even the top five. It was the sixth or seventh, if I recall, search engine that came through. And the first five didn't have a monetization case, and Google wound up figuring out the puzzle. And, just, and I saw all the things in the 90s and the tech crack and the tech crash and all. What intrigues me about this is, and I'm not a minimalist as to blockchain has no economic basis. It actually probably does, and someone will figure it out, and I'm very reminded, I'm gonna give you the bull side, of, and then I'll give you my real, is when I first met in the 80s, actually, the head of Bell Labs, if anyone doesn't know that, it was AT&T's you know, uh, labs and all, he said, and I asked him all his years in research, what was the biggest lesson I could take away and learn in my tech investing? He says, when big change happens, okay, it always takes longer than you think to happen. Always, much longer. He says, but when it does, it happens much faster than you could ever imagine, when it finally does, okay? And where that compares to all of technology evolution, even this, and this is what worries me, maybe I'm wrong in my, because I'm bearish actually, but I'm, maybe I'm wrong, so I'm gonna give why I could be wrong. Maybe we're in that first stage where all the hype is happening, because usually you have excitement, hype, disappointment, and then years later, the use case, the broad use case actually happens. Because right now I really feel strongly we're in that first excitement, hype, I don't know whether the broad use case will ever happen, it might. But what worries me about Bitcoin in particular, I'm not just a markets guy, okay, that's all I am. I don't think much, I'm a, and I'm a, I'm a practical guy, not a research guy. And in markets, it's like, okay, Bitcoin comes along, and it's going up because the taxi driver's talking about it, and everybody's in it. Why do they own Bitcoin? They own it because of the greater fool theory. I'm gonna find someone to pay me a higher price, okay, and I'm gonna miss out if I don't own it, and I gotta be involved in it, and all the rest of it. And then you see how many other coins are there? If you put up coinmarketcap.com, or whatever, it's like, oh my God, supply. You know, the last thing you want is interoperability. If you've got interoperability, then supply is infinite, okay? So the value of these, now they may still have an amazing use case as being a utility to provide this, you know, ease of transactions and all the positive things. But what I'm bearish on is the value of Bitcoin, if you notice. I'm not bearish on blockchain having value, but if they're all interoperable, actually it would be great. Mm -hmm. Or if the medical system all figured out a way to keep medical records in some better way that use blockchain, wow, wouldn't that be great? But would we be using Bitcoin as a very high value thing? And I'm also reminded, I think Bitcoin, sorry, I'm real biased about this, mm -hmm. is a massive regulatory arbitrage. I don't want the governments, the officials anywhere in the world to know something. I want to create a system that's beyond governments. Have you found anything, maybe in the history of humankind, there is something where officially the official sector doesn't come back with a vengeance and get its fair share. So I think blockchain can be very good as a utility to make a lot of other things. It's like, what are the killer apps that will come and it was true with the internet. When the killer apps came, guess what? Amazon was a killer app, and Apple was a killer app. Well, Apple's different, but Facebook, et cetera. And oh, by the way, all of them, so because you're going you know, to say why I would say there were 500 billion or a trillion in them, remember, there was an installed base of value, Amazon's case, 100% of global retail, that they could disrupt. Wow, they have not even 5% yet. I don't know whether you should own Amazon stock or not. I'm not trying to say that. But wow, you know, or, all of global advertising, you know, that's what's Google, you know, wow, and they're a disruptor, okay? I, I, so maybe Bitcoin becomes the utility that some app resides on top of, that is, you know, and it becomes ubiquitous enough in 10 or 15 years, and I actually think something will happen. It's just, will wow us all that we hadn't even considered, but it's in the second phase, not in this first phase of hype, disappointment, and I don't think we're, anywhere near the disappointment. The disappointment takes years, and then all of a sudden, they, like the phoenix from the ashes, it rises up again, and it's once the distributed process is all out there, and there's not nodes like a Bitcoin nodes, but nodes of users. It's like, guess what? You know, these things in our phone, hands, distributed these, until these were all there, you couldn't have a Facebook, right? 
Facebook needed this first, in a weird sense, or they needed the desktop versions of this first. And I still think we're very early days of this stuff. The real value will be made, and I'm telling you, you'll make major investment dollars somewhere five minimum years, maybe 10 or 15 years out. And it'll be some sort of thing that's enabled because of this, but it's not going to be these first guys. There's too much supply. And Sorry. there, I had no idea what he was going to say, but that's been true for 60 years. So. <laughs> Sorry, do you have a question for him? And then I'm going to do a couple more slides. Sean, yes, the question. Uh, I think it's really interesting always that you mentioned that if once the Amazon has a, has a time, um, and Facebook has a TAM. And, and during the peak of its bubble last year, people were referring the TAM of um, total addressable market. Total addressable market. Go ahead. Uh, to to the goal, to to the uh, to the, the the market of gold. And what's your kind of perception on that? And do you think that's a, a real, to some degree, a realistic kind of assumption? Hey, I guess, but gold has five thousand years or even longer of being the scarce resource that no one understands. I certainly don't. But it's the own, you know. It mining, and so it's got a lot of stability from that. If Bitcoin truly was the only one, but how many? You like said there's 160 of them, and you just said they're going to all be interoperable. So I don't know what the currency exchange. So is supply really constrained? I don't know. So I don't know. I mean, maybe you know a better answer because I know I know that comparison. No, no, it's a real challenge. One of the things about valuing. One of the things about valuing any crypto, and I told you at the beginning, I'm just not going to run a class that tells you how to invest in or out of crypto, but here's just an observation. And feel free to ask more questions. But that if, if any token, I'm not just talking about Bitcoin, any token, it could be file sharing app like Filecoin, has a really good, good use and it's being used, you have to start to jump to say, what is the velocity of the token? And any of you that have studied a little bit about uh, macroeconomics and you know the velocity of money, it's how many times a, a, a piece of currency turns over. It's sort of the economy divided by the, the monetary base, whatever your measure is. So how many times does a, does a piece of currency turn over? In the digital age, it can turn over faster. If it were just file storage, and I'd get file storage from James, and then James wants to you know, get file storage from Hugo and, and along and along, and if there was high velocity, you need fewer coins. Almost like the higher the velocity, the less value in the coin. So you almost need some people to be holding on to the, the, the James wants to hold it because he thinks it's a good store of value and not use it for file storage. Because if all you're doing is turning it over, whether it's file storage or, or, or anything else, it sort of lowers the value, higher velocity. And yet, you, it's kind of counter to it. So I don't know. There's a mixture in the valuation mode of speculation, store value, usability, but not too much velocity. <laughs> I'm going to say one last thing. I am convinced there is huge value that's going to be created, but it's in the things that are enabled to be able to be done by this. It's not in the, I don't know if you call them coins or tokens or whatever. They're the enablers. And, and if you've got a really expensive one, somebody else is going to have a cheaper one that will enable all this great potentiality. And somebody will, and, and there'll be huge value so in that. Me, that's just my Because, Alon, I just want to cover it. You can stay up, Rob. I just want to. So we've already talked about this, but I just want to remind you of this. It's sort of like centralization versus decentralization when, when we're, we're all thinking together about the economics. And again, you could change the slopes. The, the cost of decentralization might come down, the, the orange one. But as you know, I'm sort of a little bit closer to permission systems than permissionless systems. Uh, and in terms of traditional databases, we've done this before. But again, the public blockchains versus the traditional databases, and I don't mean every word you need to remember or anything like that. But if you don't need a ledger, if you don't fundamentally need something to move around property rights, I think you're probably in the traditional database side. You can move over into the middle if you think that an invention of the early 1990s append only databases, the blockchain, 
sprinkle a whole bunch of cryptography on top of it, the hash functions and the digital signatures. That's kind of your permission database systems. It can give you finality of settlement. It can give you an awful lot, but it's a club deal. And amongst the big commercial banks or amongst some system, they, they're, they're doing a lot there. I think to get to the right-hand side, we'll need to get some of this performance behind us. In some single-digit years, get the performance up to speed. But still, even after those three or five or six years, when we get the performance up to speed, I think you have to say one of two things. One is this is, a, is this a lower cost of verification? And it might be, and I say this for your final projects too. If you find a pain point that has high economic rents, this might be a lower cost. If you find a pain point around privacy, a pain point around censorship, like it depends on what the pain point is, or if you're just something that's not yet centralized. I continue to believe that if you're trying to attack, if you all are trying to attack a centralized system with blockchain, you've got to basically go through the door of lower verification costs. Lower economic rents, lower privacy, lower censorship, but lower some verification costs. If it's currently a decentralized thing, there's no centralized intermediary, it might be that token economics are a way to jumpstart the consensus and the collective action. But I remind you, even in medical records where there's no centralized thing, you still have to think, how is this going to jumpstart and get over this darn collective action problem that has existed for decades? Or loan syndication is another example. Collective action, it might, it might. And by the way, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan and Bank National Paris and BMP and others, they trust each other only to an extent. So even the middle, the middle category, you know, these club deals are a little odd too. Um, so I'm just repeating, this is gonna be something you've seen. So <clears throat> can you lower verification costs? That's my core thing. Can you lower verification costs, whether it's direct costs, privacy, censorship, settlement and finality risks, and the cost of trust or economic rents? If you can, this might be an alternative to the centralized databases. Or does it jumpstart through some reward affinity, and I love this skins, you know, is it somehow help you jumpstart something? Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah um, I was just thinking about what, what are your thoughts collectively on... Collectively? No, yeah, both. Uh, double spend. So, so Bitcoin is, I mean, there's no necessarily like intrinsic value, uh, like direct like peg where you can say like, you know, this is tied to this. But what about like tokenization of some assets, you know, namely maybe real estate where uh, it, if you sell a piece of real estate on a new, you know, uh, on a new found token, right? You kind of understand kind of where the market value of that piece of real estate is from, you know, sales comparables, et cetera. Um, but the value potentially add from tokenizing the asset is lower transaction okay. costs. So you can kind of directly peg a value to the real estate and also the value from the cost savings from not having to pay those transaction fees. So the, the real question is, is there an application of blockchain technology to using a token to digitize an otherwise either a liquid or liquid asset? Because it could be. Dan used real estate. But you could just as well say, is there a role to have a blockchain token and underlying it is oil or underlying it is gold or maybe underlying it is a basket of equities or even fiat currency? I think yes, it's sort of a, a, a newer, modern day version of exchange traded funds. Or it's a modern day version of re warehouse receipts. Paper money started exactly this way. Paper money was like, please, uh, will you store my grain and give me a warehouse receipt? And then it was gold and I'll take a warehouse receipt, and it was easier to exchange the paper warehouse receipt than the gold or the wheat and so forth. So 
I have to say from an economic point of view, there's a long history. The answer has to be yes. However, caution is, particularly when you get to illiquids, is it really going to create liquidity where there isn't liquidity? Real estate is still very idiosyncratic. Gold is very fungible. Gold is something that doesn't um, degrade. It could be in a warehouse. Now, it might be that they start issuing too much paper. But I, so I, I, I think that I have to say yes with a big footnote. And I'm not as sure when you get to the, uh, the illiquid end of the curve. But the, the highly liquid, uh, commodity end of the curve. Um, but even on the commodity end, you might say, well, what, why is this any better than an exchange traded fund? And particularly by the time the securities regulators say yes to it and sprinkle holy water on it, it might look like an exchange traded fund. Eric. A quick point, um, going back from that point to lowering verif verification costs, there's a point I think Catalini makes that when you have uh, the necessity of matching an offline asset to the digital version or representation, then you kind of um, don't gain the, the same lowering costs as you would do when you're dealing with a purely digital um, um, asset. So that could actually set the stage for some sort of collaboration with existing intermediaries that could kind of uh, work on the uh, making sure that that offline and digital version matching can be right. forced. So what I think Eric's talking in the Catalini paper is that a digital token tied to some other digital asset, there might be higher benefits than tying it to something that's offline. I colloquially call them illiquids, but not everything offline is illiquid. Um, and, and his point is basically if it's digital to digital, it it's probably has more benefit and, and there's less costs embedded and it could be with less friction. Um, and that's one reason why it might have more applicability in the world of finance than it does to the world of diamonds or supply chain management. But one of the reasons I think it might have a real benefit in supply chain management is supply chain management has not dealt with collective action issues in the past. So rather than verification, supply chain management and healthcare records are somewhere down in the network thing. Maybe this is a way to start to jumpstart or get some of the network effects. Um, in here. Oops, starting or operating. I knew there was something else on this page. Um, did you have anything to add? No. Um, so we're going to do the same thing on Thursday. You don't have five readings and five optionals. I know it was a long list. I think it's only, what is it, four. An open letter. <laughs> Let's see. I know you're a bunch of business school students. The open letter to, to, to Jamie Dimon's kind of brief, and the Economist articles, two pages, and so forth. So um, McKinsey's is so-so. I'm not going to say all of these McKinsey's and PwC and the, some of them that I put in, they're general surveys. But I like to include them with the academic papers, because this is what the business community, they skim. They look at these things. It's McKinsey. Some of you are going to go work for consulting. Tom. Um, and so, you know, it's good to know what that vocabulary and that, that, that world's about. The Geneva Report, you've read some of that. That's, of course, Simons and Nehas and, and Jonah and Michaels and my, we came together. But we tried to sort of lay out some of the, these economic issues in there as well. Um, any other questions, uh, Ilan? Any other questions for Rob, who, like, actually knows something? Yes, that would be relevant. Yes, so some of the questions, some of the comments on the from the minimalist point of view were uh, actually about money. They 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 they, they, they consider cryptocurrency a currency, but if they are securities, so there's no need for a medium of exchange or a medium of sound. There's no need for monetary policy. There's need maybe for issuance of of of, of securities. 
uh, policy, but it's not monetary policy. So if it's not coins, some, I, I just disagree with, if it's not currency, I, I disagree with some of the comments. So you, let me just step back. I hope that many of you do, 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 going on this journey and doing these readings don't need to agree with many of the things that are written, whether it's by the minimalist or the maximalist, whether it's by the tech folks or the McKinsey's that are doing big, you know, kind of glossy business reviews. I hope you come to your own judgment and opinion, just like you have. I will react to what you're saying. I think that, that whether it's a currency or a security is relevant for the regulatory situation. It might be reg relevant to the business cases, but I'm not, I'm not with you on that. I'm, I'm probably not with you. I don't really care if you call it a currency or call it a crypto asset. What I'm trying to interest in is, is blockchain technology in the permission or permissionless way something that can either disrupt the incumbents, do it cheaper, do verification cheaper, do databases, ledgers cheaper, or is it a neat, nifty way to to jumpstart a new network. And we're literally, if we did not have Uber today, I could see, wow, that would be an interesting use case. You could use something like this to connect a community of, of people that own cars, people that want to drive cars, people that want to rent cars. And, and as someone that lived and lost a lot of money, made a lot of money for others and disruptors, think it to yourself, because I just, is Bitcoin and blockchain, I put them together for this statement only, is it going to be a disruptor to traditional stores of value, the monetary systems, dollars, euros, yen? You could be disrupting that. Or is it a disruptor for medical records or Uber? Type? Is it an enabler to disrupt some other industry? I'm betting on the second case. I actually think this will someday be a disruptor to some industry. Just like, guess what, the internet, we didn't know it at the time in all last year, was a disruptor to the taxi industry. Somehow it happened. <laughs> you know, we, nobody saw that coming in the 90s, but the taxi industry got disrupted, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Airbnb and the hotel industry, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, all this stuff. So is, and it might be a disruptor to the monetary system. That's one bet. I actually am negative. I'm bearish on that bet. But I'm very bullish that it will be a disruptor on things that we're not, aren't even talking about yet, haven't considered, or maybe you guys have. And I think that's the more interesting discussion, is what's it going to disrupt as an enabling platform? So uh, I thank you. We're going to close with your question. But also, remember for Thursday, for those of you that feel that you wanted another way to participate in the class, it's not required. And it's not required. You can participate. We'll have a little bit of this discussion about whether it's minimalist, maximalist, blockchain economics is Thursday, not discussions of something that's not related to Thursday.